here on God, Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of the Blessed Month of Abib. And this month we've been focusing on the apostles. We've been focusing on their service, their life, the blessings that comes from being an apostle, um, and the reward. We see the reward today. Today we remember the miracle of our Lord that he did on his way to the cross. The Lord resurrects Lazarus, a man who was a dear friend of God, and, and he was his disciple. And he was the brother of Christ's two nearest and dearest, Mary and Martha, who served him. And we know Lazarus got sick and he died. And as done in those days, he was laid in a tomb in a cave. And then the cave was sealed shut with a stone. And enough time had passed by for his body to start to decompose. And when Christ came to resurrect him, his sister said, there's already a stench. And in these words, there was no doubt. There was, there was doubt that, there were, that this kind of thing could happen, that he could raise him from the dead. How could a man be resurrected whose body was visibly decomposing? That is, he hadn't just died yesterday. He, there was clear, obvious signs of his bodily death, and it could be very clearly seen, and there was evidence of that. But our Lord, he raises Lazarus. And this serves his name for, for years to come, generations to come. And he calls him out of his tomb. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And it's important to recognize the raising of Lazarus can be interpreted as a metaphor of sin and death in our own lives. He calls each one of us by our names. When we speak of sin, we understand it as missing the mark. This is the most traditional definition of sin that we have. That missing the mark. Our mark or our target is God, Christ. And sin is anything, any deed, any word, any thought that moves us away from Christ, missing the mark. And some, sometimes these deeds, these actions take us very far from the mark. St. Paul further elaborates on this idea as sin. He talks about it as work of darkness. This is referenced in Romans chapter 13 and Ephesians chapter 5. Darkness is an image of ignorance when it comes to sin. And so it's an image of shamefulness. And most people talk about hiding their sins in darkness. They hide their sins for most people. Uh, nowadays with social media, that's a little bit different. But most people have shame when it comes to sin. And they start to hide their sin in darkness. And the reality of this is that more sin brings more darkness. And it brings darkness to the mind and to the soul. And it's this dimming of the light that is in the, within us. And it leads to more sin. And so there's a bit of a snowball effect when it comes to darkness and sin. And to elaborate a little bit more on this, it is no coincidence that the church throughout this week has been reminding us of other people that Christ has raised from the dead. Earlier in the week, on Wednesday, the Gospel of Wednesday, was the raising of the widow of Nain's son. On Vespers yesterday, if you came to Vespers yesterday, there was the Gospel reading of raising Jairus' daughter. There were three people that Christ raised from the dead. The widow of Nain's son, and Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus today. And... St. Augustine does a beautiful connection with the three people that Christ raised from the dead. And he reminds us that these are three people that Christ raised from sin, different degrees of sin. Jairus' daughter, she had just died. It happened in the room. It happened just immediately, and, and Christ raised her from the dead. The widow of Nain's son, he died, and he was being processed to the tomb. He wasn't yet buried. And Lazarus, he, was di he died. And he was buried. You can see the progression. Someone who had just died, someone who is being processed to die to be buried, and someone who is buried in his tomb. And St. Augustine talks about this being the three stages of sin. It starts with thought, and then an action, and then a habit. And, and St. Augustine says, no matter who you are, no matter which stage of death you find yourself, Christ raises each one with his voice. He says to each, he calls each one by their name and says, come forth. 
come out of that stage of sin. Today we're going to focus on Lazarus being entombed in sin. Sometimes we are entombed in a bad habit. Sometimes it could be something like an addiction to a substance or to an activity. Sometimes we tell a lot of lies. We're, it's a, we're habitual liars. Sometimes it could be that we spend too much money or we invest way too much of our time in video games or in social media. We're addicted to these things. We're entombed in these things. Without these things, we feel like we're going to lose our peace. But today, our Lord and Master is calling out to each one of us. He is giving us power to walk away from all that. All of us know what it's like to be buried under a trauma or anxiety. We're wondering about our careers, our jobs, our businesses, our work. We're wondering about the people that we love, if they're going to get sick, if they're going to be okay, if their health is going to, is going to take them for a while. Sometimes we, we have anxiety about the relationships that we have. Even the godly relationships, we stress, we have anxiety over those things. We, we sometimes find ourselves constantly thinking about the worst case scenarios. But today, Christ, our master, is calling out to each one of us. He's saying that he has his healing power over all of that. Many of us are buried in tombs of hatred and resentment, and I'm going to spend time on this today. We are entombed by resentment. We are entombed by hatred. There's a lack of forgiveness. There are some people in our lives that were so bitter. We can't even think about their, their name without grinding our teeth a little bit. Clenching our fists, our blood pressure starts to boil. Even the mention of their name. Sometimes we, we relive old arguments. We replay them over and over. What they said, how they said it. We rehearse what we're going to say to them if I ever have the chance. We fantasize about horrible things that might be happening to them. If we hear that they're going through a challenge, we feel, ah, justice. We feel justified. But today... In the context of raising Lazarus from the tomb, our Lord calls us to come out of that darkness. He gives us the power to forgive. Part of being a human being is understanding that our actions matter. Each and every action that we take has an effect on the people around us. We come together and we ask for forgiveness of each other because we need forgiveness of others and we need to be forgiven. And that's true of our own families. And that's true here in the church. We spend a lot of time together here and with our families and with our church, with our church family. We pray together, hopefully within our families. We eat together. We laugh together. We, we do our chores together. We serve each other. In the midst of all that, it's easy to get offended with one another. And we treat our family members like, like punching bags. We treat them different than anybody else. Our Lord today is saying, let go of those things. Let go. A grudge is an excuse. To have a grudge is having an excuse. It's a way of saying to yourself, I don't have to work on myself. I don't really have to focus on myself because the real problem is the other people. It's them. It's not me. A grudge is a whisper from the devil. The devil whispers and says, you have every right to be offended. How dare they? They say to us, you have every right to act the way that you're acting. And if you can actually act even worse if you wanted to, it would be completely justified. This is the way of the demons. This is the way of the devil. They want us to condemn others while we excuse ourselves. 
Like we have nothing to do with it. And our Lord says, our crucified Lord, he alone teaches us the way. We have to focus on the cross. He does the exact opposite of what the demon suggests. He is the opposite of selfish. He allows himself to be condemned while he excuses others. He alone could descend from his throne and ascend to the cross. He alone can ask for the forgiveness while be hung on the cross. Our Lord loves us and proves this love by teaching us to forgive and then showing us how to really forgive others. This act of forgiveness is an act of unconditional love. We love poetry. We love songs about love. But I'm speaking for myself. We struggle with truly what it means to love without the image of the cross. We don't really know what love is in our society without having the cross as the lesson. Maybe some of us are, are harboring bad thoughts towards one another, towards other people. Maybe some of us have withheld love from those who need it. And we use it as a bargaining chip, manipulation. We withhold love in order to prove a point. Don't be like the demons who only do things out of selfish reasons. Be like the angels who do what is right with joy because God expects it of us. The Lord gives us one of the great secrets of the universe. In a way of speaking, we hold the keys to our salvation. When we forgive others, we allow ourselves to receive forgiveness from God. When we release others, God will release us. He says to his apostles to loosen the bounds that withhold Lazarus. To release those bounds. He shows us to love in a way that doesn't depend on what others do to me. It doesn't matter what, what happened to me, but rather on what I believe that God has done for me. That is more important. We don't keep tabs of the wrongdoing that people do against us. Instead, we focus on what God has done for me. That is more important. He didn't wait for me to become perfect before he decided to go to the cross for me. And St. Paul tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing thought. He loved us before there was anything that was worth loving. He loved us while we're still sinners. It's time to heal. Leave those things in the past. Walk away from the tomb. Let the priests pray the absolution over you so that those bounds, those that grave clothes can be loosened from you, that you can walk clearly away from the tomb. Sometimes you will find that even married couples harbor some bad feelings of resentment towards one another. It's like a cancer that eats away from the relationship slowly. It infects every part, every aspect of the marriage. The signs of this type of resentment is like eye-rolling and sarcasm, impatience, rudeness, and a general lack of joy. If you can't forgive your spouse who is joined to you by our Lord Jesus Christ, how can you forgive others? As our Lord himself says, what credit is it to you if you only treat people well if they treat you well. Even the evil and the ungodly do that. 
But what God expects so much more of us because we are baptized as his children. He expects us to forgive others as a sign that we remember just how much we have sinned against him and how much he has wiped away our wrongdoing. If in all honesty, we would be crushed under the weight of our sins against God if he decided to remember them all. I know I would. Absolutely. We would be terrified if we had to stand before the judgment seat of Christ with all of our sins. This is the beauty of confession. Don't take this gift for granted. But this is exactly what will happen if we behave like judges and we, ex and we remember everything that others may have done against me. But I conveniently forget what I have done to other people. Our Lord and Master is calling us today. He's calling us by our name. He's calling us from death to life. Forgiveness is life. Forgiveness is life. This is one of the main virtues that we have as Christians. We are people that forgive. That's how we're known. We're people that forgive. And we don't simply forgive when it's convenient, but we forgive everyone, anything that they have done against us. No strings attached. It's a requirement as we pray our Lord's Prayer every single day, hopefully. And we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's a requirement. You have to think about that. The prayer that we say every day assumes that we are forgiving others so that we might be forgiven. But it's, it's not a simple forgiveness of the lips. It has to run deep into the heart. We can't just say it with our words. We have to say it with our heart. One of the most important aspects of forgiveness is one that we probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Your ability to forgive others is directly proportional to whether you feel forgiven by God. Yes, our relationship with God affects the way that we deal with everyone and everything around us. And this is specifically true with forgiveness. When we refuse to forgive someone, it's as if we hold them as a prisoner until they pay their damages against us. Thankfully, we see that the Lord does no such thing. Can you imagine? He is quick to forgive and to heal everyone who asks. No sin is too big, no matter what stage of death you find yourself. No sin is too big that he can't be forgiven by God. We come and we confess these things, and the Lord himself will bless you through the hand of the priest. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Another common problem that we see oftentimes is that people say they have forgiven or they have gotten over something in the past, but when, but when, whenever they're irritated or angry, you find them bringing up old things again, especially in arguments, especially in households. We keep tabs. We have to be careful of this kind of behavior. Every Christian has to be aware of this kind of behavior. We have a tendency of towards that, but it's not good. Can you imagine? This is something that we see common in marriages. Husbands or wives bringing up old sins of the past whenever it's convenient. And we dangle this in front of the people and there's no chance of repentance. There's no chance to let go. There's no chance to walk away. We're constantly being reminded of our shortcomings. This is a very toxic behavior that we have in our households. We can't keep tabs this way. No, keep tabs of doing good. Keep tabs of the, of the blessings that you receive from your spouse. 
keep tabs of the positive things and remind them of those things. Can you imagine if God did that with us? Every time that we made a mistake, every sin, and we're constantly being reminded of our sin, what growth would we have? What chance would we have? If we have a problem together, we deal with it. We pray together. We pray together on our knees if we have to. And afterward, we have to completely forgive. Completely forgive. No strings attached. Holding on to hurt is like feeding a cancer or... You remember those old cartoons that were really destructive? Those acme bombs with the long, long fuses that the coyote would light and try to get the roadrunner? Holding on to hurt is like feeding that and lighting that fuse. And if you give it enough time, the tumor grows out of control. The bomb explodes. We fight. We fight a lot. Our forgiveness must be full and complete. And it must come from the sense that God has forgiven me so much. This is the least I can do. And he continues to forgive us. Don't allow yourself to be chained with anger and pain. When God gives us freedom by teaching us what it means to be forgiven. We also have to forgive everyone before God will listen. He doesn't listen to our prayers if we don't forgive people. St. Isaac the Syrian says, Someone who bears a grudge while he prays is like a person who sows in the sea and expects to reap a harvest. It doesn't work. We need to be able to stand before God and say from the bottom of our hearts, Lord, I have forgiven everyone, anyone who has offended me. And, I, and remove even the slightest feeling of resentment from my heart. It wasn't easy. But I have done this because you have forgiven me. And if you need help, talk to your father confession. Don't delay that conversation. Get on your father confession about that. We're all busy. Everyone's busy. But this is a matter of life and death. We get urgent phone calls when it comes to a family member in the hospital. I want this to be an urgent phone call. This type of resentment, this, this anger towards one another. Let this be an urgent phone call to the priest. So to conclude, as children of God, we are encouraged and even required to share this amazing experience with others. To accept others and to renew their hope. To wipe away their failings. The pain that they have caused us and to love them with the power of forgiveness. Our top desire, I hope, as Christians, as his sons and daughters, is to be like him. I hope. And so there's a warning that our Lord gives to those who don't learn to forgive, and it should terrify us. One of the Eastern Fathers says, Do we refuse to forgive? God, too, will refuse to forgive us. As we treat our neighbors, so also does God treat us. The forgiveness or unforgiveness of your sins, then, is also your salvation or destruction depending on you yourself. For without forgiveness of sins, there is no salvation. You can see for yourself how serious it is. We may never be in danger of losing our salvation with a lack of love. That's easy. When we lack love and forgiveness... We are like people who shut ourselves out from the kingdom of heaven and lock the door with our own key. Receiving the love and forgiveness of Christ, we begin to unlock the doors of love. We begin to unlock the doors of the kingdom of heaven. And we allow God to call each one of us by name out of the tomb of resentment, the tomb of anger, this is our path to fully embracing the love of God. 
as we embrace it, we will be healed by it, and we will offer healing to others for their benefit and ultimately for our salvation. May God allow each one of us to feel the gift of forgiveness and to pass on this gift to others. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are they.